Okay, we are now recording. So I'm going to introduce our folks and then I've got some questions for them that are um, kind of aimed to steer the conversation, but this is really gonna be a question to any panelist who has something that they wanna say about it. You're all experts in, um, in a lot of different ways. And then let's just be mindful of the time that we've got about five to 10 questions um, seven questions that we're going to get through that we have already. And then I'd like to leave time for um, the audience to ask questions. We keep going over on these panels because they're so much fun, but we, we have gone over and I want to be mindful of people's time. So without further ado, we have joining us. And if you'd like to just wave when I say your name, if you have your camera on, that would be great. We have Sean Worth, board member and conservation consultant of Save Our Sandhill Cranes. Hi, Sean. There he is over there with that nice new beard. We've got David Fries, board member and conservation. There he is, consul consultant from San Joaquin Audubon Society. I don't see Gary. Are you here, Gary? Nope, that's okay. But uh, maybe Gary will join us later. And if he does, he's from Western Crane. He's the Western Crane Conservation Manager from International Crane Foundation. And then we've got Deirdre. Deirdre Desjardins, uh, sorry, did I, did I pronounce that right? Yeah. It's always what I've called you, good. All right, um, she's the Director of California Water Research and we have Chris Tooker, President, there he is in the corner for me, of Friends of Stone Lake. So thank you so much, all of you for joining us. Uh, the wealth of knowledge in this room is just really fantastic and this is gonna be a lot of fun. So I think the first question I wanna open up with, give us a, a real, basic understanding of everything right now. What, so what are some of the amazing creatures that currently call the Delta region home? Peter, you wanna start with the fish? You're on mute. You're um, muted, Peter. there you go. Yeah, so there's um, Delta smelt, which are endemic to the Delta and are unfortunately critically endangered. Um, they're a little uh, annual, three, three to four inches long and spawn every spring. Um, there's uh, these huge Chinook salmon, king salmon that migrate down the Sacramento River. Um, and uh, there's, uh, you know, on the Sacramento River, there's a spring run and a winter run and a fall run. Uh, and in a you know, late fall run, all of which uh, migrate at different times and uh, um, and spawn at different times. There's um, uh, these these fish were just incredibly numerous um, before the turn of the century. Um, and then there's um, fish that also migrate, chinook salmon that migrate on the Sacramento River. There's enormous sturgeon that are, uh, look prehistoric. There's green sturgeon and white sturgeon. Um, and they only spawn uh, in really wet years, mainly. Um, and uh, there's um, uh, a, a number of other fish. There's striped bass that are very popular with anglers that have, uh, were in introduced fish, but they become a naturalized citizen and uh, have existed in the Delta for years. Um, there's a really amazing Delta fishing, recreational fishing industry. And um, there's a commercial uh, salmon fishing industry. The salmon migrate here, migrate as far north as uh, Oregon um, and as far south as Santa Cruz. Uh, the king salmon. So um, it's uh, an enormously fertile uh, area and it's also um, the fish feed an enormous variety of seabirds and, 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 and migrating waterfowl. Yeah. One second. Leslie, I don't think you meant to share your screen. <laughs> yeah. How to undo it from here. Great. Thank yeah. You. So Excellent. that's that's some of the fish. David, you want to cover some of the birds? I just lost uh, video, but could you hear me? 
Yes, yeah, we you see you. We can see okay. you. Okay, I lost your video. I'll work on that. Uh, there's many kinds of birds besides the fish we talked about. I was out there today and I saw river otters and I saw uh, even uh, sea lions. But in the terms of birds, um, last year's Christmas count I did in the Delta, we had over 100 species in a day, including species that are endangered or threatened as the California black rails, the sandhill cranes, which I saw about 5,000 of today or so, Swainson's hawks, which migrate here and depended on the delta habitat for survival, white-tailed kites, yellow-breasted chats, uh, yellow warblers, and I could go on and on of the types of birds that are there that are just fabulous to see any day of the year. And in huge numbers. Yes, well, the first uh, snow, uh, uh, yeah, the, the white geese come in today, the first of the snow geese, a couple hundred of them. Wow. Well, Where were you that you saw all these birds today? I'd like to talk about Stone Lakes a little bit, talking about the animals, uh, the, the refuge, which is about 15 miles south of Sacramento, uh, supports wintering waterfowl, sandhill cranes, and shorebirds in managed wetlands. It also supports uh, black crown night herons, blue herons, and egrets, among other uh, aquatic birds. Um, the ref refuge also supports fish and other aquatic species within three lakes that total uh, nearly 400 acres. And there are also several miles of riparian habitat that support forest birds and rookeries. Wow. Wow. I, I didn't know that sea lions uh, go that far into um, into the delta, so that's exciting. They come all the way to Sacramento sometimes. And they follow wow. the fish. <laughs> they follow the fish, that makes sense. Yeah. All right, so can you tell me what is the biggest threat to the delta currently, right now, with the way things are right now, even before the tunnel gets started? Well, for Stone Lake, the biggest threat is urban growth and the conversion of habitat-friendly uh, agricultural land to vineyards and orchards and other non-friendly uh, lands for habitat. Uh, we also have uh, impacts and potential threats from uh, the tunnel project as well. But the principal threat is from urbanization and associated development. And for the Delta in general, it's also diminished water. So much of the water is removed from that entire drainage for agriculture and urban uses, and not enough is flooding into the delta. So you're not having the, the rejuvenation that's needed in that aquatic system. So it's, it's a huge problem. The last iteration of the tunnels, they're originally gonna have it as a project tied to a large habitat conservation plan for the delta, but the federal government threw it out because of the incredible hypocrisy of creating a plan to take more water out of a system that's starved of water. Yes. It was, it was, it was so, such a, a uh, oxymoron that it just was untenable. So they separated the two. Have the conservation plan disappeared and we were left with the tunnels. Yeah, I would agree with the first two of those that uh, both water quality and uh, loss of habitat are key, but also I'd like to say that the uh, threat of sea level rise is very important. And basic species in the delta is, is critical right now. It needs to be, it is related to water quality and uh, flow and so forth. So these things are all interrelated and very important. What are some of the um, most no, dangerous? I just, Go ahead. I just Deidre. wanted to answer. So there's an important thing as well that um, there's a long standing problem that the pumps in the South Delta are so massive that they run the San Joaquin River backwards at its mouth. And then, and, and when they do that, they pull in all of, you know, the flows of the Sacramento River and it entrains fish and entrains plankton. It exports enormous amounts. So part of the reason the Delta has crashed is it has the lowest productivity of almost any estuary in the world. And part of the reason is they've turned the hydrograph on its head. So they release, they hold back water in the spring when it would naturally, and, and, and 
late winter when it would naturally flow into the delta in the reservoirs, and then they release it all in the summer, you know, when the plankton would naturally grow, and they wash all the plankton and all the all the fish into the pumps. Um, and there's these enormous reverse flows, and um, it just goes back to the original plan for the state water project was to augment the flows of the Sacramento River by 900,000 to a million acre feet a year. And that was gonna be from a dam on the Eel, a Dos Rios dam on the Eel River in Mendocino. It was never built, um, you know, conservation kicked in. And so as a result, they have these permits for far more water than, than they can actually support. And, and so that's why, but these reverse flows are not only going to rapidly drive the delta smelt extinct, they're also going to drive longfin smelt extinct, and they're also being very bad. Um, winter run Chinook are critically endangered, and so are fall run, and they've also had to close the West Coast salmon fishing industry. And we are not set up, the State Water Board is not set up currently to mandate flows for other uses if we drive these iconic, you know, native fish extinct. We're not set up for to man to provide flows which which provide all these other beneficial purposes for the delta, for water quality, for um, boating for recreation. There is an ecosystem, but it's very highly altered and there's a lot of non-native species. Wow. But so it, it, it's, it, it's a massive threat. And the Delta Stewardship Council, the Delta Independent Science Board has determined that the uh, Delta ecosystem can't, is it, it, the changes are irreversible and it's a very bad finding and I contested it. They said, due to climate change, it's irreversible. It can't be fixed. We've got a novel ecosystem. And that's very concerning to me as well. Wow. Wow, it's pretty serious stuff. Um, David, you said that the invasive species are one of the biggest threats. Can you, um, can you tell us what are one or two of the most threatening of the invasive species there right now? Well, there's all kinds of them. There's uh, animal type species like the zebra snail, uh, zebra mussels. There's uh, um, the mitten crab that damages the levees. There's this nutria, which is a giant rodent that is invading the south of the delta. But in and um, in terms of plants, particularly, they're recovering the surface of any much of the water, uh, particularly this. Um, uh, Hyacin, uh, water hyacin, um, is just just it obliterates the surface. There's areas you can't take a boat in at all, and also birds can get there to feed. Uh, there's this agaria, which is the Brazilian uh, water weed that grows from the bottom and up, and uh, it in any water of 10, 15 feet, it grows from the bottom up and just obliterates. So fish can get through it, birds can feed in it. Um, uh, the state has a big eradication uh, program for it, but it's out of control. And one thing that, that helps control it is uh, high flows in the springtime. Uh, it'll wash a lot of this stuff out and the tunnels um, decreases that ability to, to flush, flush the delta, which is uh, really a critical issue. And certainly the tunnels taking a majority or a large part of the fresh water flow would exacerbate that. Thank you. That's a perfect segue. So can you tell us now what are some of the big threats to the Delta region from the tunnels if the tunnels were to be built? I just wanted to say that they would make the deprivation of flows worse. So one of the things um, currently there's limits on how much water uh, the department, the Delta, two huge pumps in the South Delta. There's Central Valley Project pumps, State Water Project pumps, how much water they can export. 
So they can only export about 35% in the, in the spring and 65% of inflows in the summer and fall and winter. Um, so those, um, what DWR said is, oh, the intakes are new, so those limits don't apply. So they'll only calculate the export limits once they've taken water through the massive intakes. And the other issue is that the bypass flows are not sufficient. You have to have enough flows to sweep fish past the intakes. And um, the way they have it set up, it's very tidal there in the, and at low flows, the water can slosh back and forth and fish can be, if, you know, young chinook salmon or whatever can be um, trapped as, as a too, for too long and they get exhausted and impinge on the intakes. And the proposed bypass flows are just way too low. And experts have said that the, the, the intakes are enormous. They're a thousand feet long. And they've said they'll just be catastrophic for salmon and, and probably for other fish as well. well. For the Stone Lake Refuge, if the tunnels were built and operated, uh, it would result in 10 years of construction related disturbance and habitat loss and it, due to increased traffic, noise, and light pollution. Uh, so it would be a very significant impact. Uh, we're actually trying to increase uh, habitat, reestablish habitat, and not losing habitat. It would be a, a significant uh, impact on our pro programs. It's probably the largest construction project in this part of California ever plunked right down on top of the most productive flyway in the country. Yes. And it's going to be a 14 year project with huge impacts throughout the whole northern part of the Delta. And it's going to result in these giant infrastructure placements that are going to be in some of the most critical areas for a lot of the iconic wildlife that we're trying to protect, like Sandhill Cranes are going to have a access shaft on Staten Island, which is ground zero for Sandhill Crane population. That's if we go with the central corridor. If they go the eastern corridor, they're going to have a large access shaft not very far from the Woodbridge roosting site. So these are huge, huge, enormous projects right in the middle of one of the most important areas in the state for wildlife conservation for a 14 year period. And then when it's finished, you have all the problems that, that Deirdre was mentioning. Yeah. Aquatic impacts, as well as the ongoing disturbance from operation. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm going to I hear a lot about harmful algal blooms. Is that something that we we think is a real threat to wildlife as well as people, or not as much of a, an issue it, for animals? It's absolutely an issue for fish. So they've tested striped bass, and they found they have liver lesions. And one of the issues is. So I've already said how 97% of the primary productivity in the Delta is suppressed. There's areas on the San Joaquin River where the algae that is in the water column is pure microcystis. And it's just, it's just toxic. It's toxic to fish. It's toxic to wildlife. And um, so it's not just the suppression of phytoplankton. It's that the, 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 the phytoplankton composition has shifted not just phytoplankton, but zooplankton. So there's these little tiny animalcules that the fish eat. And because there isn't enough plankton, there's not enough um, zooplankton. And that's why, you know, a little tiny fish like the Delta smelt that was formerly one of the most abundant fish in the estuary is on the verge of extinction. So um, yeah, it's, it's very concerning. Um, that things like it's low flows and high temperatures that are associated with harmful algal blooms. And it would still be an issue because of the increasing temperature, but we're not having the flows that would, you know, break up the harmful algal blooms and improve the water quality. 
And, and the San Joaquin River also has an issue that there's insufficient flows. And during the summer, it's almost pure agricultural tailwater and it's packed full of nitrates um, that just seed the harmful algal blooms. Mm -hmm. You know, as with other part, portions of the Delta in the Stone Lakes Refuge, um, we're dependent on reliable water supply to maintain water quality and habitat for wintering and breeding water birds. And the refuge has had outbreaks of cholera at times in late winter, but to date, no botulism over the summer or fall. There have been increases in toxic algae in the Delta and Stone Lake since 2017 that can affect humans and other wildlife. So the whole question of water availability supply uh, really affects quality, uh, affecting many uh, fish and, and birds and other animals. Chris, I was going to ask this a few questions down, but since you brought up botulism, um, I don't know if folks saw that in the Klamath Basin area recently, 40,000 birds were killed by botulism over there because of stagnant waters. And um, Sean told me that's not something we need to worry about right now in the Delta area, but if water became stagnant um, because of you know, low flows and everything else with the tunnel. Is that something that we would have to fear in the Delta region as well? Well, the question, the question you had asked was, could we tie that type of thing to the tunnels? Mm -hmm. I was explaining that we, we do get botulism in the Delta. It's not that uncommon at the Kissimmee River Preserve. And the way that it, it, it's in the soil, it's a, it's a, a soil um, microbe that's a problem. And if the water's left stagnant and there's no water flows going through there, the little animals tend to eat it and it gets concentrated up the system. When the birds finally get it, they get fairly high concentrations of it and it kills them. And then when they die, the little flies and things that come and feed on their carcasses can also spread it to other birds. So it all comes down to water flows. And this has come up many, many times. Same with the, with the harmful algae. If you don't flush the system, if you're letting water sit and stagnate, these are the types of problems you're gonna get. And it's not something that'd be very common in the river system proper but in a lot of the areas that they flood up for waterfowl use, it's a definite possibility and it has happened. They've had very large die off of coots and various other aquatic animals in the preserve. That makes sense. Um, are there any, do, do you foresee a chance that any of the fish, birds, any other wildlife might leave and not return um, if any of these problems get serious enough? I could say that it's already happened. Um, habitat loss. We used to have breeding uh, uh, um, yellow warblers, uh, yellow-breasted chats, um, a half a dozen other species of birds that don't come here anymore because of that uh, redhead duck, uh, on and on. And um, yeah, we're, we're afraid we're going to lose the sandhill cranes. We're afraid we're going to lose the Swainson hawks, uh, a number of species. Uh, the white-tailed kite uh, needs the habitat, the open area around the delta where they, where they um, forage. Uh, yes, uh, to your question, it's a great threat to many bird species. And we've also seen historically the disappearance of most of the native fishes of the delta. Um, and with changing dynamics of flow and reduced flow, I'm, I'm sure there would continue to be impacts on other species with uh, limited niches in the delta. The North including, including, of course, migratory fish, where there are already a lot of critical problems. Yeah, already. The northern roost sites for sandhill cranes in the Sun Lakes National Wildlife Refuge, they're very close to the intake placements. And there's a lot of concern that uh, the construction of those intakes will potentially cause them to abandon those roosts, which will reduce their, their geography. And that's already a very constrained area by urbanism. So it's kind of right on the, the precipice of disaster anyway. And that could easily be something that will throw it over the precipice and we'll lose some range for a really important bird. Wow. An iconic bird, a four foot tall, beautiful bird. I, I just wanted to say also that the Delta smelt, so there's been a huge amount of litigation since the 2005 emergency petition to uh, uplist the Delta smelt from threatened to endangered. Um, 
by the Bay Institute and NRDC and others. And um, a number of protections under the Obama administration were created for Delta smelt. And those fish are right on the brink of extinction. They are not finding them at most of the monitoring stations where they used to find them. They, they, are, they didn't recover. Normally they recover during very wet years and they, the population didn't recover and they're thinking they're becoming so scattered that they're just, they're not gonna recover. So when those fish go extinct, um, then, you know, the, there's long fin smell that um, breed more in bra brackish water and those are also um, close to extinction. And there's an issue then that, that the protections that are associated with these fish, they protect, you know, other beneficial uses. They protect the whole, uh, you know, there, there's a whole ensemble of pelagic fish which, in, oh, which is the open water fish, which includes the, um, the uh, striped bass that aren't native and they're, they've got protections for those fish as well. Um, they just, because uh, supposedly it's a problem if the striped bass feed on the uh, uh, Chinook salmon, but in reality, all, all of the protections for these fish and for this whole on, ensemble as part of this ecosystem is just going to be gone, and then it's an issue of you know how you get sufficient flows to avoid problems with you know more harmful algal blooms, low dissolved oxygen, and then also with droughts. Um, the Bureau of Reclamation has essentially gutted. They used to have rules for carrying over cold water pool. Uh, from year to year and for protecting that. And that meant that in, they couldn't just be greedy and export all the water south so that there wasn't any more water if it was a dry year. And when they run out of that, then there's this disastrous situation like we had in 2014, where they do this temporary urgency change petition and say, we don't have enough water to meet the water quality standards. And that's when fish really start to go extinct. That's what hammered the Delta smell from 2014 to 2016 was waiving the water quality standards. Wow. Um, I know about 200 years ago, we had California grizzlies in the Delta. Are there any other animals, fish, birds that we know of that um, are completely gone from the region that are just not going to come back? Many, 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 many. One of the things to think about, kind of an exciting kind of blast and look back to the past. During the winter, 40% of the Central Valley filled with water yes. overflowing from the river. So it was enormous, incredible, unbelievably productive wetland. And you had probably the largest grizzly bears in the world, enormous herds of wapiti elk, huge herds of pronghorn antelope, wolves, black bears, incredible numbers of birds. There's an early description of a French traveler who went to the Sacramento area and he described the liftoff of the geese as starting with a report of a rifle followed by the sound of a hurricane as the entire sky just completely filled with literally millions upon millions of birds. Our iconic sandhill cranes, they would come when the valley was flooded. They liked to roost in very shallow water. They'd roost right at the edge of the floodplain in very, very shallow water. The next morning they wake up and they walk a few feet further as the floodplain extends out bringing more fossorial animals out of the soil to feed. So it was an incredibly productive system, possibly the largest biome on the planet. And we've channelized all the rivers and we've turned it into an agriculturally productive area with some very beautiful remnants. Yes. And of course, a lot of changes have occurred also in wildflower and native grasses and other plants, as well as valley oak forest, which formerly dominated the landscape, but now only exist in uh, remnant areas. So it's really an ecosystem, uh, basically the disappearance or shrinking of an ecosystem that's uh, occurred historically and is continuing. That's hard there, were, there were enormous quantities of salmon too that migrated down the Sacramento River 
and just historic reports. People describe the, some of the native spawning screams and they, it, you could walk practically walk across the backs of the salmon because they were just wall to wall on the stream. Wow. Oh, I'm getting choked up. All right. Uh, this is, oh, that's so sad. Um, all right. This is my last question. So of all of the alternatives that we talk about, we talk about gray water, we talk about stormwater capture, brackish desalination, water recycling, water remediation. Those are the ones that we tend to push the most. Are there any of those alternatives that you would say would be the best solution for the Delta, any of them that you see have some unintended consequences that maybe are not so great for wildlife or is it a combination of things? What's your opinion would be the best alternatives um, to a tunnel? I just want, oh, go ahead. I'd say certainly it's a combination of things and, and the wisdom of it. I mean, the key, the, the key thing to save the Delta is to increase the flows. And we as scientists have, it, it goes right back to basics. The solution is in the dilution. So if you don't flow, you don't dilute and you create problems. So um, certainly we need to reuse water um, any way we can. Um, and I'd also like to point out one thing. They talk about using uh, more desalinization and the energy cost of that. The few people realize that the biggest user of electricity in California is the California Water Project. The, the energy it takes, the electricity to pump this water out of the Delta. 30%. Yeah. So um, a lot of, there's, there's a lot of, of false talk um, and, and really needs to be studied scientifically and, and utilized. Yes, and certainly we can do better. You know, I, I agree that what we're facing here is really an integrated problem and it needs an integrated solution. And one thing that's happening in Sacramento County that is the kind of things that we need, need to do more of, uh, the Regional Sanitation District is developing a program to provide high, <coughs> highly treated wastewater to farmers to irrigate crops and to help recharge groundwater levels in the lower Kasumnas Basin. The program has goals for enhancing habitat for wintering cranes that use farmland between the refuge and the Kasumnas, Kasumnas River Preserve. And there's, also, there's also efforts to take water off of very high flow years on the Sacramento River and put it into the aquifer. So there are new techniques to, to create stores of water that don't require giant tunnels or giant dams. Um, Deirdre can back me up on some of this. If you look at the economics of this tunnel project, it's really quite shocking. So 70% of it's going to be used for agriculture in the southern San Joaquin, which has huge problems with their soil. The water tends to bring up lots of heavy metals and the soil gets more and more deteriorated to the point that eventually won't be usable. The tunnels are so expensive, we could buy pretty much the entire southern San Joaquin Valley, retire it, and make up for the other shortfalls with conservation, nothing more no need for this giant project to provide an area cheap water that doesn't really fit the criteria for being a good place to grow things. I, I did want to say that that analysis is from when the Central Valley project was going to participate 50% in the project. And it turned out that Farmers can't afford the tunnel water. It's a real issue. And I've actually talked with um, some of the state water project contractors that are small agricultural irrigation districts have said, we can't afford this. We don't want to participate in the tunnel project. And so actually their opponents and they've, they've structured the agreement in principle so that Kern County Water Agency and you know, has to either participate at their entire 25% of the state water project or nothing. They can't come in and say only a few of our, few of our, our retail water agencies want this. We don't want to participate at a full level. So DWR is putting the screws and saying you, to, you need to participate at 100% or nothing now because actually it is too expensive for agricultural water 
I had a talk with Jeff Michaels and a while ago and he said, uh, you know, yeah, it's too expensive for them. Um, so people grow, Stuart Resnick is not a farmer, he's a water broker. So the, the water isn't too expensive for Stuart Resnick because he's gonna turn around and resell it. And he has a spinoff company called Roll International Real Estate Building Subdivisions in the Desert. So it's perfect for that. But if people just want to grow, grow crops, it, it's too expensive for most crops, except possibly for almonds or, you know, some of the really high value crops. Yeah, uh, for context, Stuart Resnick is from the wonderful company, like Wonderful Palm and um, Pistachios. Yeah, I think that we are seeing a lot of the smaller ag uh, contractors are, they seem to be opting out and Met's share right now of the next phase of tunnels funding would be 65%, but they're going last, I think, because they want to see who else will opt out so that their share might increase. Um, I think it's very realistic that it will increase. And I think the board knows that and they're worried that they're going to have to pay 70, 80% of the share for this water. Um, when you're right, a lot of it's gonna end up going to agribusiness. So that's a big concern. Um, you mentioned that there's gonna be water, um, wastewater diverted in the Sacramento area. Uh, Metropolitan and Los Angeles County Sanitation District, they are working on something similar as well for um, the regional recycling plant in Carson down here. And that would be, um, Right now it would be going to commercial. They're still in the pilot phases and um, testing, but it's a pretty remarkable system. That water is the cleanest I've ever heard of. And um, once we have some statewide frameworks for direct potable re reuse water, then that it's, you know, at some point we can drink that water, but um, the law hasn't caught up to the technology yet. Uh, that framework should be, the law should be a framework for the laws presented to the state water board should be ready by 2023. Um, and then once they kind of hash that out, that um, that's definitely the future of water. That plant won't be ready until, until 2032, but um, that'll be an exciting source of water. Um, one, less, one less pressure on the state water project. So that's very exciting. So I think now we will open up to questions from the audience. If you've got something Wait, pressing. One, 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 Go ahead, Chuck. So one of the other hats I wear is the conservation chair for the Motherlode chapter of the Sierra Club. Mm -hmm. Our geography is a huge chunk of Northern California. So we're able to see how the tunnels project leads to the creation of other projects that are relying upon the ability to export the water. So the site's reservoir, we wouldn't need it without the tunnel project. The Shasta Dam Rays, which would back up the McLeod River, we wouldn't need it without the Shasta Dam Rays. And then one of the huge concerns we have is if you have a system to ship water to the south and sell it for a lot of money, would be to put a big straw in the Smith River, the only undammed river coming off the west coast there, Northern California. And that's, that's a huge concern. So wow. it, it, it extends beyond the Delta. It's horrific for the Delta, but the impacts extend beyond the Delta as well. Are there plans for that Smith River diversion or? Everybody's denying it. Okay. <laughs> it's on the untapped river that we have. I mean, it's, it, yeah, everyone says it's not gonna happen, it's not gonna happen, but we've seen how that's gone in the past with the water politics in the state. There's a lot of that going around. The, oh, it's yeah. not gonna happen, yeah. Wow. All right, folks, do we have questions? I'll read some from the chat, but um, if anyone has something they wanna ask right now, go ahead. I have sort of a question. It's also sort of a statement. I got really fascinated with sturgeon at one point and really studied them and their important function in the Delta. And they used to be 20 feet long and weigh 2,000 pounds. They were as big as small whales. And they're just an incredible presence. They, you know, they love to leap out of the water. And it's just, you know, it's so sad. They practically were extincted because of the harvesting that was done until the very early, late 1800s, early 1900s, they realized they were wiping them out. But they're really impacted by uh, water that's too warm and doesn't have enough oxygen in it and inadequate habitat for the, their fry. And it just would be so sad if we caused the demise of, some people say 640,000 
million year old species. Like they really are ancient. So if any, if any of the speakers know anything more about sturgeon, I would love to know. Uh, I, I looked at closely at sturgeon. Interestingly enough, one of the issues with sturgeon is selenium. Mm -hmm. So um, sturgeon eat clams and there's these um, invasive clams, Pultocarbula amnurensis, which are all over the delta and are also combining to strip the plankton out of the water. And the sturgeon would naturally increase in uh, numbers, except the clams concentrate selenium and selenium impairs the fertility of the sturgeon. So I, I ran across this and I thought, wow, that's fascinating. It sounds like if we, you know, if we protected sturgeon more, but it's because sturgeon spawn during very high flows, um, my impression was that Fish and Wildlife Service, you know, and, and, and uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife in California don't want to mandate the really high flows that sturgeon need to spawn. So it's only when they have such high, high flow years that the water just has to spill out of the reservoirs that the sturgeon get those flows. And the concern is that it's not often enough for the species. They're very long lived, but if they can only spawn so many years, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's still quite a few in the Ill River. The big ones. They're still tagging the 15 footers. Mm -hmm. Liz wanted to know if the smelts are to go extinct, how does that affect other species in the food chain and what will the ripple effects be? Well, the smelt are so rare now that there's already been effects on the food chain. And actually they call it the pelagic organism decline, but the whole open water pelagic ensemble of fish, the striped bass that are bigger, their population have crashed, threadfin fit shad, which are an introduced non-native fish, their population has crashed. Um, so American shad populations are down too, although not as much. So there's just this whole ensemble, it's almost gone. And so there's these Arkansas lake fish, their um, centrarchids um, are um, largemouth bass and some of these other fish and they're the ones that like the that don't mind the warm still water and the ageria uh, the brazilian waterweed and so on and uh, they they're more um, edge fishes um, so there was this whole peter moyle found there was this whole kind of profound shift in the 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 central delta central and south delta ecosystem um, and, and, and there was, it's called a regime shift, you know, the whole, whole, uh, ensemble of fishes that was there has changed. Sue wants to know, what are the chances of this happening? Of what? The regime shift happening? It's oh, already the happened. The tunnels. Yeah. The tunnels. Oh, the tunnels. Oh, the tunnels. Um, I think I'll tackle all of the tunnel related and what we can do questions um, in a minute. I just want to see if there are any more wildlife related questions. I'd like to know um, if, if, um, if we could talk a little bit about, so the salmon and the feeder fish that end up out in the ocean feeding the, the whales, the orcas, um, the seals, sea lions, what, what kind of effects do you think we'll see on, on those guys? You might have to raise your hand. I think so. So the issue is um, a lot of um, a lot of the production is actually of Chinook is now fed by hatcheries, and they're doing they're like they truck the hay in drought years. They, they they didn't release the fish in the river. They trucked the salmon down to San Francisco Bay and released them there. And that's why we still have some, but then you get these fish that don't know how to make their way back up to the stream that they spawned in. 
because they never came down. They're actually doing experiments where they're barging the fish and then the water flows in. But, you know, it's not a long-term solution. Um, and, and yeah, orcas, um, there's also a salmon shark or something that was washing up, starving. I mean, there, there's a lot of disturbances to the ocean as well, and there's upwelling, and there, there's issues there. Um, so the ocean conditions are affecting salmon as well, and that is, um, you know, we see there were years starving sea lions were washing up in San Francisco Bay, you know, it was affecting marine productivity. So the freshwater, you know, and the salmon productivity is kind of on top of these other effects on the ocean. And, and it's really not good. The, the flushing of the Delta was a huge nutrient input into the coastal area of California. And it pushed out actually past the fair lines. So that upwelling that we see out there that creates the biggest plankton bloom on the planet, it's from those terrestrial inputs. When we reduce those flows, we reduce those nutrients, there's not as much to be upwelled, there's not as much plankton, there's not as many little animals to eat the plankton, all the way up to the whales. So it has a, a system-wide impact. And one of the things, like first they weren't going to analyze the impacts of a tunnel past Susan Bay, and so they didn't analyze any of the larger impacts on San Francisco Bay, although there were huge concerns about that when they're going to build the peripheral canal. And now they're not even going to analyze the impacts on Susan Bay. The North Bay, closest to the Delta. Katie, I think you're muted. I don't, we don't hear you. I don't hear you. No, no, I'm not muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, Joyce, it looks like you've got a question or your partner there does. Yeah. This is her husband, Lawrence, and uh, Hi, Lawrence. Uh, Sean, is that, uh, my I read, yes, Sean, I, I, I've run across some of the things you were talking about, and I was involved in, during the peripheral canal days back in the 70s, writing letters and doing those kind of things, and I heard about the big agri-farmers down there, you with the cheap water flushing out alkalines and everything else, and I haven't heard anybody talk about the Kesterson Canal and the disaster that caused. What's going on with that kind of a thing now? Because I, I kind of thought they probably slowed down their irrigation practices. And well, there, there's been an interesting change in that whole heavy metal situation in the San Joaquin. It has uh -huh. to do with how they irrigate. So they used to flood irrigate, and that would tend to allow some of the heavy, heavy metals to percolate down a certain distance into the soil. Now it's all drip, which brings it to the surface, which is more likely to run off and be a problem. So it's, it's getting worse. Oh, no. And it's, we're trying to conserve water, and the effort to conserve the water is great in terms of having more water, but it's creating this additional problem of bringing these heavy metals to the surface. OK, yeah. I was there, there is. So I did want to say about a third of Westlands is now fallowed. So what happened during the 2014 to 2016 drought was they fallowed a lot of the low value crops and transferred the water to grow nut trees. So everything on all Westlands is on drip. A lot of it is permanent crops. And there's a big area, the area that was most contaminated. I followed this closely. Um, Westlands has over 100,000 acres of retired land. It was enormous in their most recent uh, agricultural water plan. It was like 160,000 acres or something that is just not being irrigated anymore. And it's because, because of the naturally occurring salts and uh, boron. It's not selenium, which is toxic to wildlife, but the salts and boron that uh, it just made it so it's not profitable to grow crops on there anymore. Um, so there's a question, if they disc the land and spray it with herbicides, then it creates this enormous blowing dust, which creates huge air quality problems. 
And then they say, oh, that's because of the endangered species. And it's like, no, you're just pretending that this land is going to come back into production. It's worthless. Yeah. But yeah, almonds take four acre feet per acre. So they're still using a heck of a lot of water. Wow. Yeah, so what happened was they concentrated on this high value crop. They concentrated the water they did have on a smaller part of the district. Is, isn't the walnut crops a little bit north? Um, Are they down uh, in the southern San Joaquin? Also. Um, yeah, it's up along I-5. So in Westlands, there's the lower part that was the original Westlands. And then West Plains sort of is where the land starts sloping up gently. And so it was the West Plains that's on the valley floor that had the water and supply. And then West Land, or West, Westlands, and then the West Plains that had the better soil. And so all of the uh, West Plains farmers sued Westlands uh, and said, we want you to equalize the water supply in the district. And Westlands agreed that they were going to buy up land as it went out of production. And so they bought about 67,000 acres of land and retired it and transferred the water up to the almond trees that you can see along I-5. And then there's these huge areas along the valley floor that are just, you know, dirt, bare dirt and tumbleweeds as far as the eye can see. And I've taken extensive pictures of them. But that land is not profitable. Westlands owns a lot of it. Um, and they're continuing to buy land during droughts as as people take the bad land out of production. Christina, you had a question? Christina, can you hear me? We, we can barely hear you, Katie. I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on. I'm not, I'm not muted, but Christina, you had a question? Um, yeah, well, I guess I didn't realize I still had my hand up, but uh, you know, there are a group of people who are really talking about how we rehydrate California. I mentioned it in my comment uh, this morning. And, and the question is, uh, are the issue is that we really need plants covering all of the soil, not only to protect it, so carbon isn't actually off-gassing into the atmosphere, but also so that we get the small water cycle happening. Because when you have plants, they're transpiring moisture into the atmosphere. And so, Westlands having these 160,000 acres of bare land that's fallowed is a complete disaster for the climate of the Central Valley. And they need to be forced to plant something on there, something that will, can handle this particular climate and, uh, and, and get that, the water cycle happening again. And so that can actually sort of shift, start shifting the climate in the Central Valley. So it's a conversation that needs to be happening and uh, it's just exciting that people are actually imagining how we could create a, a more moist environment in the Central Valley. In the so first def time. Defenders of Wildlife mm -hmm. has been working on that, or no, Environmental Defense Fund, sorry, has been working on mm -hmm. that. And they're aware it's not just in Westlands, there's 100,000 acres, well, actually 160,000 acres or so in, in uh, Westlands, but there's a huge amount in, it's worse in the Tulare Lake Basin. Uh -huh. An environmental defense fund is working on trying to acquire, get a program, and unfortunately this is probably a victim of the coronavirus, you know, tanking of the economy, but they're trying to get a program to buy up these blocks of fallow land and turn it into upland habitat because the San Joaquin Valley has the highest number of endangered species and it's just because it's so heavily transformed you know and I've been out and they just channelized you know every single water course on the valley floor and it's all just bare bare dirt you know so yeah the, the, the if you read the early Westlands documents when the federal government was going to be involved in the land retirement, there was a plan to return it to upland habitat. 
but instead it was done privately by Westlands. And as a result, you know, it's, it's a human health disaster. Um, there's no habitat for creatures. And part of the reason they deliberately disc it and spray it with herbicide because they don't want any endangered species moving in. That's why they do it. They're doing that even though they aren't growing any crops on it? Yes. Yeah, yeah they, it's deliberate because they don't want any endangered critters moving in there. So they're trying to this have is a, their attitude, yeah. Devoid of life. They want it to be lifeless. Is that what you're saying? Um, yeah, that I mean that's what I've heard. Yeah. So, so I'm confused if it's foul if, if it's fallow, if they're not planting, what is the financial benefit to them to keep the land and not sell it to EDF or some other nature conservancy or something like that to produce the upland habitat? They're taking the water and using the water elsewhere. Yeah. Oh, no, it's a water rights thing. That, yeah, well, yeah, that yeah. So West Westlands is actually the landowner for a lot of this, and I've gotten um, like plot maps. It, it costs, I don't know, it costs some money, you, but you can buy these plot maps and see who owns lands. And you, if you look in these areas where I know the fell land is, you can see Westlands, Westlands, Westlands. So wow. Westlands actually committed just fraud when in, it was very famous picture of Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger coming out, you know, and it was like, you know, oh, you know, look at the law, the land that was fallowed, you know, because of the Endangered Species Act. And I'm like, look, oh, look, that land's retired. All the water's been transferred someplace else. They were just pretending that it was going to come back in production. So are you saying that if they sold that land, if Westland sold it, even though they're not using it, they would lose the water rights? No, they could keep the water rights and sell the land itself. Mm -hmm. There was, so there's a West Side Resource Conservation District mm -hmm. and they were struggling. They're not funded, you know, because these farmers are cheap. But, you know, I went out and one point they had a bunch of sheep on the fallow land, mm -hmm. um, you know, so some of it's been converted to grazing. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, last time I went out, the sheep were gone. Mm -hmm. So, you can look and you can see this huge area that's just barren and, and yeah it's bizarre and the thing is the farmers don't live there I looked and one of them has a condo in um, um, in Pebble Beach you know it's the workers that live near there there's worker housing mm -hmm. one of the things so you've got a question Go ahead, Sean. About Stone Lakes, one of the, the big threats was the conversion from row crops to things like orchards and vineyards, which don't provide much habitat value. We have the situation in the San Joaquin area where there's insufficient water to be growing these high value crops like vineyards and orchards. As a result, they're coming up into the northern part of the delta and paying way more than market value for lands that have decent water rights. And they're taking out all the corn, taking out the tomatoes, taking out alfalfa, and they're putting in vineyards and orchards, which means there's no forage for swains and sock, no forage for sandhill cranes. And it's done on a purely economic basis because they want to be sure they have reasonable year-round water supplies. So we're seeing the, the results of the changing economic landscape for water in terms of the immediate impact on our forage lands for many of our iconic species, including our listed species. So it's, it's a huge problem and it's extending throughout pretty much the whole of the valley at this point. And no one can afford to buy that land for conservation because you're not going to be paying two or three times the cost of the land. You, you just just out of curiosity, Sean, what, what is an acre cost there? Um, well, typically to buy an ag, an ag acre, it's anywhere from about eight to 11,000, but folks okay. are paying 24, 25, 26,000 and they're doing it to get the water. Okay. And you, you can't go buy land like that if you're doing a conservation effort and pay that kind of money. Right. It's just right. not possible. So it, it cuts out any, any conservation folks from picking up land. It cuts out a typical farmer from being able to do it. It's, it's the, the, big, the big boys are buying the land and they're doing mm -hmm. it specifically for the water. Okay. So ag, ag conversions from row crop to orchards and vineyards has been fairly catastrophic in the Delta. And you have look, one vintner alone um, was going to do 40,000 more acres of vines. Oh. Cranes need to have lots of open ag land 
to be able to forage. And you're just chopping it away bit by bit and there's very little left. They can't even land in a vineyard. They can't land in an orchard. Mm. And we're not, we're not saying that we should constrict people's ability to be able to take advantage of the economics of agriculture, but we need a mosaic of crops. We can't have yeah. orchards and vineyards and we're gonna lose all of our iconic species that are just gonna be gone. And all we're gonna have are basically little birds that can tolerate lots of pesticides because they're spraying all those trees and all those vines. Is it possible to legislate, you know, everybody hates the thought, but regulations about what can be grown where and about how many tree crops there can be that take so much year round water? Well, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, if it was implemented properly, would limit where you could grow almonds because the other thing they're doing is they're mining groundwater because they don't have enough water. Like I said, in, in Westlands, you know, in the Western Fresno, it's 48 inches of irrigation in four acre feet per acre. And the most they ever get is two and a half feet per acre. And they don't, they don't get that in hardly any years. So they transfer water from other places. So instead, what they want to do, the Central Valley Project has their own plan to increase exports from the Delta, not involving the tunnels. They just want to raise the sides of the Delta Mendota Canal and export more water through, through the Central Valley Project pumps. And, and, and that's a whole disaster. And it's all like, oh my God, you know, we're going to have to change our crop mix, you know, if otherwise we'll lose money. And it's like, what, where's your God-given right to grow almonds on every square inch of desert in, in the San Joaquin Valley? With bare ground underneath, it's not transpiring. There's no plants there to, you know, yeah. what if I go? But a lot of that your... ground used to grow wheat, you know, which uses a lot less. Winter wheat doesn't use any supplemental irrigation. Yeah, it's all ambient water. S Leslie has um, Leslie's had her hand up for a while. Let's, let's give Leslie a well, chance. Thank you. I just one question, sort of to clarify for me, when you talk about water rights, now are you talking about the right to allocations from the state water project, or are you talking about groundwater that you know is under the land as well? I, I'm a little unclear as to, and if you sell the water rights, does that include the groundwater? as well or just the water rights to the state water project water so the water rights are normal it normally means the surface water allocation that goes with the land and ground uh if you're overlying an aquifer you have rights to pump from the aquifer which is being limited by the yeah, sustainable groundwater management act which is still ramping up. It, it, it hasn't been implemented yet. People are still doing their groundwater sustainability plans. So the regulation has not begun. At this point, they're just trying to get the infrastructure and the plans in place to be able to regulate it. And, and, and honestly, people have looked at the sustainable groundwater management plans in the Silicon Valley, San, I'm sorry, San Joaquin Valley, and they all assume supplemental water and many of them have, all assume uh, many adjacent places assume the same supplemental water source. So there's double and triple and quadruple counting of supplemental water that they're going to get. So they don't have to change to a more sustainable crop mix. Okay. And what water law is basically now, a, it's a, a derivation of British common law that has been transplanted to a different country and put into an incredibly complicated economic system. So it's, it's a disaster. And what about the Native American, the tribal people that were historically there and some still are, presumably, do they have any water rights or are you guys consulting with them in terms of, you know, the species? And I know they used to do sustainable fishing and other kinds of things. Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Association's attorney who I work with works regularly with the tribes. The biggest tribes are um, the Trinity River tribes, the Hoopa, the Yurok, um, okay. Okay. 
uh, and, and they have substantial water rights and they successfully litigated about that. Um, there is uh, in the Delta, there's um, the Sh Shoshone band of Indians, but they, they have been, they just have gathering that they come do. There, there aren't um, villages in the Delta anymore. There were villages in the 1950s and reclamation came in and when they dug the Delta cross channel, they displaced them and they're just gone. Our next panel will be on indigenous uh, folks who are involved in this. So we'll, we'll hear from more indigenous um, people about what's going on there and their take on everything. Um, I think that unless there's any more, is there a one last urgent question? Anything else pressing? Okay, so um, I saw earlier that someone wanted to know about, um, is this a done deal? Is the tunnel a done deal? Is there anything we can do about it? It's not a done deal. Uh, Jeff Keitlinger, one of the biggest players in this whole thing, even said last week that we're on year 15 out of probably 20 years just trying to get permitting for this tunnel. So I think even they know that there's a chance that they might not get this to happen in some form or another. They've been trying to get this tunnel to happen since the 1940s with the peripheral canal. They're just giving it different names. I think it's had five different names for basically the same project since then. Um, so it's not a done deal for sure. And right now, our biggest target is Metropolitan Water District, at least through December. We'll have to see how that goes and then uh, maybe turn towards the governor or some other water districts or ag after that. But right now, that is our biggest focus. Um, so if you haven't heard already, December 8th is the big vote where Metropolitan Water District, their board, will be voting to fund the next phase of planning. So it's a two-year period, and then it'll be another two years after that for more funding or for more planning and permitting. And then after that, in 2024, would be the construction of... Um, $15.9 billion right now, but we estimate closer to 40 billion and that will happen in 2024 unless we could stop it from happening right now. The funding piece of it, um, that's where we were talking about the 65%. That's where MET would pay 65% of the share and then smaller districts would pick up the rest of that. If we can convince them that this is a bad idea, they have, um, They've even said that that will kill this tunnel. Um, I mean, they'll probably try again in a few years, but they've admitted that if they cannot fund it now, it's going to kill it. And, you know, we're in an economic downturn. We're in a worldwide pandemic. Uh, we're in a time of racial justice when, you know, people of color in the South will be paying for this um, to steal water. We'll all be paying to steal water from people in the north. So with the racial justice climate, this is also another time to really evaluate all of these things. 2020 is kind of the perfect storm for us to look at all of these things. Additionally, at MET, they've also got their integrated resources plan, which they said today will now not come out until April. Um, April of this upcoming year will be their their first draft of that integrated integrated resources plan. And a lot of us are saying, well, how can you and that's their, that's their long-term plan. That's about a 25 year plan where they decide what are the big projects that they want to invest in. And it looks at the alternatives, the scenarios, the drivers, the futures of, you know, is house population doing up, down? Is demand going up or down? Uh, what are the prices? What are the rates? What's everything doing? So a lot of people have already said, well, how can we make some kind of huge investment into a tunnel when we don't know if water is, um, going down, I mean, we've seen a steady dec uh, decline in demand since 2016, is that going to continue in the long term? And how are they going to make these decisions? So a lot of folks are saying you can't make any decision of this scale for the tunnel without the IRP being finished. And that's not until April. So we might even be able to buy some time. And the more time we keep buying, the weaker their, their stance comes um, on this project. We're also looking at the change in um, structure of a general manager. So there's a lot of drama right now with the general manager situation at Met and um, employee structures over there, but their current general manager is on his way out. He's leaving in March right now, Jeff Keitlinger. 
They've started the search to hire his replacement, and uh, they've just decided today that they will indeed give us the public outreach meetings that we were hoping for. Uh, we are getting two Zoom public outreach meetings, and those will come about after their next November meeting of OPNT Organization Personnel and Technology. So at that point, they'll decide, okay, this is when it is. So we can expect some time probably late November through December, uh, those public outreach Zoom meetings will happen as well as electronic surveys, which is the perfect opportunity for all of us to get on there and say for our three minutes why we need someone who's um, reasonable, first of all, and values water sustainability, values the things that we care about. Can we say we want someone who doesn't want a tunnel, we can say that, but I think, you know, we want someone who values water sustainability and makes that their priority for their next 15 year stint. So that's a huge piece of it. Um, and then they've also, they just passed last month a moratorium on spending on new projects at Metropolitan. So they, um, they've got some loopholes and they're saying, well, the tunnel doesn't count, but I think plenty of people would see the argument that the tunnel should absolutely count. You know, this is a huge, amount of spending when they're saying no to a $40,000 increase to pay all of their senior management at MET. So they'll say no to a tiny little bit of cost of living raise for those folks, but they're willing to spend hundreds of millions on this tunnel. You know, that's, that's an argument we can make. So there are a lot of things in our favor. There's a lot of reasons why this tunnel might not happen as long as we put the pressure on the right people. So a lot of folks today called in to give public comment and that's fantastic. Uh, you can, the next meeting coming up and all the different kinds of meetings that we can attend will be the stakeholder engagement committee meetings for the DCA, that's the construction authority of the folks building this tunnel who are part of DWR, Department of Water Resources. That's on November 5th. I will be inviting the Bay Delta committee members from MET to that meeting. Most of them have never attended that and really heard from the voices of folks living in the Delta. So that's a perfect time to get on there and share your feelings about what's going on so that they can hear you. Um, it's an appropriate time for people all over the state to be talking about it. And then I think it's fine for folks from around the state to call into Metropolitan Water District because this is a project that affects everyone, but it is more impactful for them to hear from folks in Southern California in their service district. That's below Ventura County down to San Diego along the coast for the most part is Met's service district. So to hear from folks there saying, hey, we are your ratepayers and we don't want this project is profoundly impactful. They don't have a date yet for the committee meeting, but we know that this vote will first start in the Bay Delta committee meeting in December, and then it will move to the board, uh, the general board on December 8th. I think we can assume that it will make it to the general board. So December 8th will be the big day. We will have a week of action of everything leading up to um, to that moment and things you can do, ways you can call and email and all of that. I think right now it's um, it's fine to start bombarding their social media, so their Facebook pages, their Twitter accounts, and start targeting Met as a whole. Keitlinger, uh, General Manager Jeff Keitlinger is a fine target, as well as Chairwoman Gloria Gray and the chair of their committees is a fine avenue as well. And then you can start emailing them and you can start making calls on occasion, but I think generally we don't wanna bombard them with calls because you know that'll go after the clerk and then she'll have to sort it out. We don't wanna attack her right there. But yes, we the public comments are probably our most effective thing that we can do at this point. So next month you'll get a notice for the next meetings where we need you to make public comments. And that's really a big thing we can do. Um, and Charming has just put in the chat some smart alternatives to tunnels. Um, it's a fantastic white paper that Water Committee, um, including Charming and probably some other folks here were a part of um, that go into all the different things we can do. There's a lot of alternatives that we are promoting. There's, I see Deidre likes it and she would know. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we talk about all the alternatives, including um, stormwater capture, gray water, remediation, brackish desalination, all of the things that really make sense. And yes, this week I will be sending you a huge packet of all of the proper social media targets. We scaled it back a bit. We were gonna go after a lot of people, but now we're, we're just really kind of honing in on the people who need to, need to hear from us the most so that they hear a lot from us. So you'll get that this week. Um, and then be sure to check out the next panel. We have one more panel 
um, about indigenous folks and everything impacting them. And that will be the week after the election. You know, I wanna make sure people can focus on the election and making as many calls as you can last minute next week and uh, phone bank all you can for your favorite candidates. And that's important. Um, and then after that, we'll have one more of these where we talk about all the ways to get involved. So we'll talk about the things I just mentioned in detail and we can even work on some of that stuff together. So um, again, Charming has an excellent resource there. I will be sharing the recording of this on our website and I'll send it out to all of you so you can share with your clubs and anyone who wasn't able to make it, especially with the power shutdown um, right now. And yes, that white paper is already on the Sierra Club California website, as well as um, Charming's amazing map system on the Angeles Committee page. Oh my gosh, it's so cool. You can see all the riverways and the ways that the tunnels would impact. It's a really like high, high, high level um, GIS mapping system. So it's pretty cool. Um, and I think with that, we will thank all of our wonderful panels. So if everyone wants to just unmute really quickly and clap for our folks, thank you so much for our panelists. That was- Katie. Katie. Katie, yep. Um, One last this, is, this is Mary Lou. Um, I'd like to say, I know your main point of emphasis is MWD. Is it too early to write Governor Newsom and perhaps even Jerry Brown? How much influence do they have? Is Jerry Brown completely withdrawn from anything political? How much of his I don't know if he's completely withdrawn. He really wouldn't be our target. Um, you can write to Newsom, but I think that we will kind of gear up and focus on him at a later point. So if you want to kind of, it's it's impactful to kind of have everyone as a collective move towards one target at a time so that they see the sheer volume and strength. I know that hearing, they've been hearing huge numbers of public comments from us since July and met, and I, I see a difference. I see that it is wearing them down. I am getting phone calls and text messages and emails from some very important people and they're starting to notice and that groups in other parts of the state at the state level government, they know details about me that I'm quite surprised about. So I know that people are talking about this and um, it's there's an impact for sure. So, you know, we've got like one and a half months left to just really go hard on Met and then, and then we'll kind of reevaluate after this vote. I mean, this might be an opportunity to effectively kill this tunnel for a good long time. Um, if not, then we'll have to reevaluate, but this is our chance here. I Absolutely. Have, this was a, a wildlife panel. Can I close with one wildlife Absolutely. comment? Absolutely. Wildlife Please might help do. us. So the CEQA process is, is underway as well. And you have two species in the Delta that are California fully protected species. That means you cannot take them. You cannot kill them. You cannot harm them. And this is an enormous construction project and there is just absolutely no way no. they're gonna be able to make the claim they're not going to harm the greater sandhill crane or the whitetail kite. So they can't mitigate, they can't sit there and get an incidental take permit and then hurt them and then have a mitigation strategy. They have to avoid any hurt or harm or killing. So we, we have that as a, as a backup legal possibility if it ends up going to that Fantastic, yeah. What was the second one? The greater sandhill crane was the other one? The white tail kite. I think the black uh, the the black rail is included. It's okay. well taken. The California fully protected species status was something that preceded the California Endangered Species Act. Yes. I have a quick question. Um, who pays? Do taxpayers pay for the <laughs> plans that the water project is going to be undertaking for two years. Where does the funding for those plans come from? So it depends on um, who you're looking at, but with Metropolitan, they are funded in one part through property tax with the ad valorem tax that we are fighting in August, um, where they're maintaining the rate that they raised it to last year. So it's not um, higher than that, but they raised it last year and they're maintaining that. That's one part of it. And the water rates are a part of it for them. Uh, but then the D DWR piece of that, you know, that's through taxes. Um, so it depends on the player that you're looking at. The contractors are through water rates, the um, the state water agencies, you know, that's-, that's Actually, Katie, the DWR part of it, um, it's a, uh, DWR has been pirating money that was, um, 
used that was um, appropriated by the legislature to pay for recreation costs of the existing state water project facilities. And it's unlawful. And we've been arguing that. DWR has basically been playing budget sleight of hand and siphoning off money that they shouldn't be right. uh, to pay Earth, for the tunnel planning. Isn't Earth Justice the the for oh, I know it was formerly part of Sierra Club. Aren't they the group that litigates and are they involved in litigation against the things that you're talking about, Deidre? Um, the um, Delta County Coalition hired Adam Keats and Roger Moore uh, for the last validation act and they're going to do one now. Um, what DWR wants to issue uh, revenue bonds to pay for the tunnel planning, to pay for the tunnel cost. And there's going to be the all, and they issued a validation act which said, if you're going to object to this, you have to do so now. And there's going to be a bunch of responses. So we're working some with Delta County's coalition. Uh, I think the Sierra Club, there's two environmental protests. I think the Sierra Club might be by, part of one as well. Yeah, yeah. Bob Wright's handling it. Yeah. Friends of River Lawyer. You'll be happy to know that all the volunteers on this panel that are working to stop the tunnels don't get paid anything. <laughs> Thank you for your service. Thank you. We all know that one. Thank you. Yeah. This has been most informative. Thank you very much. I'm going to go have a glass of wine. <laughs> good idea. <laughs> good night. Yeah. Well. I think that's a good place to end it. So thank you, everyone. Thanks again to our panelists. And um, I'll send out the recording and information for the next panel after the election. So remember thank to you. vote. Remember to phone bank and uh, get those progressives in office. And have a good night, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye, Katie. Bye, all. Bye. Yeah. Very good. Thanks.